opportunity uh, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, his name is Chef Ken Mishka of Downs, Illinois. And he first discovered his interest in hospitality through hosting family gatherings and parties for close friends. He was instantly captivated by the ability to make people feel good and the joy of taking care of others. So during high school, Ken became wholly intrigued with the culinary world by its energy, excitement, and complexity. And so at the guidance of his uh, teachers, he enrolled in the Culinary Institute of America in New York. So curious about the business side of the food industry, Ken later enrolled at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas for a bachelor's degree in hospitality management. I anticipated that as a response. So his experience there provided the perfect opportunity uh, to blend his interest in a mathlet cuisine with the world of hospitality. While he was in Vegas, he worked in the elite kitchens of renowned hotels, uh, restaurant Guy Savoy and Bradley Ogden at Caesars Palace, and Bouchon with Thomas Keller at the Venetian. In addition, Ken has worked throughout restaurants in the US, including Solo in New York and the Broadmoor Resort in Colorado Springs. However, despite an early career in some of the country's finest restaurants, Ken never lost sight of his roots in Central Illinois. Chef returned to Bloomington in January of 2009, where he began establishing the foundation for Epiphany Farms Enterprise. The mission is to create a diversified, pasture-based food system, one that blends beyond organic farming with impeccable food. In 2011, the Epiphany Farms team became the managing partners of Central Station Cafe, a long-standing restaurant in downtown Bloomington. Within two years, the team opened a second restaurant above the first called Andrew Above, a battle of two cuisines, sushi versus pizza. Later that year, they remodeled and launched Epiphany Farms restaurant, completing the property's renovations and bringing a new look and feel to the main dining room and event spaces on the property. Epiphany Farms Restaurant has been voted as one of the top 12 U.S. destination restaurants worth the summer trip by Zester Daily. In addition, Epiphany Farms was featured in the Chicago Tribune numerous times, and most recently in Men's Health Magazine as one of the five meals that can change your life. Ken lives on the farm's homestead with his business partner and wife, Danabu, and their two children, Clover and Comfrey. Chef is committed to supporting, growing, and showcasing a thriving local food culture in an effort to re-envision the culinary landscape of today. So, if you would please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Chef Ken. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Let's make sure everything's working here. Uh, it's. This is such an honor. Thank, thank you for having me here. I get to come here and, and tell you a little bit about my, my story and my past. And um, in a lot of ways now, it's, it's my dreams that you know, 10 years ago, I was 23 years old, hanging out, um, enjoying Las Vegas, and looking at this like, really, really, really unsustainable food system, and thinking like, man, I want to do something different with my life. I want to move back home. I want to inspire people. And so to now be able to you know, speak to you know, so many like-minded individuals, it's really, really great. But I was starting to delete a bunch of slides and focus on back of the house culinary operations. And then at the last minute, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna explain the whole story real quick and then try to maybe you know, give you a little bit of insight and in how I came about thinking that this was really important uh, to start raising our own food and to start serving food that's clean and nutritious and healthy. Um, and I, I think that you might be able to enjoy it and understand a little bit more about our company that uh, is really trying to grow here in central Illinois. So I grew up in um, Downs, just outside of Bloomington. I went to Tri-Valley High School. When I was four years old, I was uh, labeled with a learning disability. They had diagnosed me with uh, attention deficit disorder. I had a speech impediment. I started riding the short bus to school. I started getting help at uh, study hall and help on my quizzes and my tests, and kind of struggled all through grade school and then into junior high. When I was in eighth grade, I was grounded by my mom and, uh, for being a troublemaker, 
And she, after a couple weeks of being grounded, she's like, I asked her, I was like, come on, please let me get out of this punishment. And she's like, okay, you want to get out of this punishment? Come to uh, Wilton cake decorating classes with me. And I was like, all right, she needed a partner. And I was like, I can, I can do that. And so we go, and the first day I, I filled up my first piping bag. I put a tip, a star tip on there, and I was taught how to make a flower and how to, how to pipe a border. And went home that day to bang out my, my homework for this Wilton cake decorating class. My mom was struggling, and then here I was just like, pumping out these flowers and these borders and like I was, I was in heaven I loved it I I could not draw I could barely I was had very very poor handwriting very poor at reading all that stuff but all of a sudden like here I am with this like piping bag and I could see my success I could see myself paying attention to detail and having flow and I like I was really excited about that so I went to school uh, I told all my teachers that I you know I was going to become a, a pastry chef was my initial uh, idea so I went through culinary arts and home ec, learned how to do cakes and um, milkshakes, continued to be a troublemaker. I went to uh, apply for this school. I was denied. I didn't get in based on my grades. And I was like, you know what? This is the best school in the world. I want to become the best chef that I can ever, you know, best chef I can be. So I was like, I have to go to this school. So I begged my mom. Uh, we went to New York. I scheduled an interview with the admissions counselor. And I basically talked my way into this school. I was like... I am gonna become a great chef someday, and it's like, this is where I wanna go. And there, it was really, really regimented. It was almost like I was in the army. You wake up every day, you gotta you know, iron your pants, iron your chef jacket, put on your neckerchief, you have to wear a toque. It was like, it was pretty intense. Um, I went there for two years, I graduated at the top of my class, and I changed from going from pastry to culinary arts. I was like, I don't want to just be stuck doing cakes for the rest of my life. I was like, I want to do a little bit of everything. After I graduated with honors, I was like, I want to go to Las Vegas, and I want to learn how to open up restaurants, and I want to pursue a business career. So I convinced five friends to move to Las Vegas. Um, I learned that the best school for hospitality was Cornell University, and the second best was UNLV. I was like, they were opening up a restaurant once a week. And I was like, here's a great opportunity for me to get continued education, go back to college, study, and then also work at restaurants and open up restaurants. So I was kind of on my path. Um, the first restaurant that I went to work for was with a chef named Thomas Keller. Thomas Keller, at the time, had the French Laundry, which was voted the best restaurant in the world at the time. Definitely one of the best restaurants in the area. And his kitchen was unlike anything that I'd ever seen. I mean, everything was so standardized, so clean. He had a little model, motto, it's like, fast fingers focus, you know. Uh, sense of urgency. If you're, if you're standing around, you might as well be falling forward was kind of like the energy of this kitchen. It was weird. I, like, I entered this environment, I almost felt like I had like a gun to my head. It was like all this like stress and pressure and I was like, I ate it up. I loved it. I, like, as I got more and more into it, I, I really realized that you know, cooking and being in the kitchen was almost like an arena for me. And it was like a sport that I could play and I could win. And so I, I loved it. Um, you know, sense of urgency, technique, not cutting corners. Uh, it was really, really drilled home when I was able to work there. I went from working for Thomas Keller to working at Caesar's Palace for a chef named Bradley Ogden. Bradley Ogden had eight restaurants at the time in California, and the coolest thing about this restaurant was that they had contracted farmers that were growing all of their product, but then we even had a buyer at the Santa Monica Farmer's Market going through all the product and sending us the very, very best. So I was super spoiled at this restaurant when it came to farm to table. Um, we were voted the best new restaurant by James Beard at the time, and I was working Garmage, the, the salad and hot app station, and I, my, my plating components would have like, my plates would have like 14, 15 components. I was able to do a really fun, artistic form of plating. All these chefs that were working there had come from Charlie Trotter's kitchen in Chicago, and so it was a really, really fun place to be uh, from a creative standpoint. And I also started to learn about seasonality. And I started learning about really, really, really high-end technique and high, high-quality product. And so here, you know, we might have like 14, 15 types of mushrooms. Um, right now, just locally, chanterelles, uh, a beautiful mushroom are popping. And it's like, because of my time there, I learned how to cook with all these diverse products. After that, I was asked by Caesar's Palace to go and be on the opening team of Guy Savoy. Guy Savoy, the goal was to create the most basically the most expensive dining experience in, in America at the time. 
Uh, they wanted an exact replica of his restaurant in Paris, which was a three Michelin star restaurant. And I went from cooking seasonal food to going to Guy Savoie, where, sorry about that. The Guy Savoie where it was all about world travel luxury. Caviar, foie gras, truffles. Um, it was the exact opposite. I made the largest purchase of black truffles, I think, in the United States history. It was 120 pounds for opening. They were retailing for, I think, like $900 a pound at the time. Um, it, it was nuts. We had one bowl of soup that was on the menu. It was an artichoke and black truffle soup. It was $68 a bowl. It was on the menu year round. And it was insane. It was like we got these fresh, beautiful truffles in, but since they were seasonal, we had to clean them, cryo back them, and then freeze them. We even had our own freezer with a padlock on it that stored all the truffles. It was like Fort Knox at Caesar's Palace in the basement. Um, it, was, it was interesting when I was there. A host friend of mine, when I was there, we were talking, and she had mentioned something to me. I don't know how we got on the topic, but she was talking about um, antiperspirant and deodorant and like in our cosmetics and our food, all these chemicals. And she's like, oh, you don't want to use antiperspirant because you, know, you could possibly give yourself cancer. Um, you're putting aluminum into your body. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't. She's like, started to open up my, my eyes. And she's like, you have to read this book. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll get this book. Um, it seemed pretty cool. Um, Michael Pollan, very, not very well known back when he released this. Uh, he, he basically follows four, four different farmers or areas, four different like, production systems. Um, though at the end of the book, he ends in the Northwest uh, with these guys that are in the forest just foraging all of these wild edibles. Uh, at one point, he goes to this, rest, uh, this farm in Swoop, Virginia called Polyface by Joel Salatin, and he, he talks about this like, really, really sustainable regenerative system where they're moving the cattle on pasture, and then the chickens are coming behind it in these things called egg mobiles, and they're cleaning up everything, they're scraping out the cow pies, and it was like, this is a really, really sustainable regenerative agricultural system. But then it also went back to the cornfields of the Midwest, which was basically exactly like this area. I mean, we are really in like the, the capital of conventional agriculture. So it follows the cornfields and soybeans of Illinois and uh, the Midwest, and then it goes to Colorado and goes to where all of our beef and our chicken and our pork and everything comes from. And what it does is it kind of exposes the industrial food system that's been built kind of without us knowing, without us really realizing that this industry has been completely consolidated and we're really, really dependent on like all of these synthetic fertilizers and all this other stuff. So this blew my mind. Uh, Omnivore's Dilemma, it really is a dilemma. You read this book and all you're basically asking is like, what's next? What do I do? What do I do? Uh, his next book answers that. It's called In Defense of Food. But when I finished this book, I, uh, I, I closed it and I right away I was like, oh my God, epiphany. A sudden moment of insight that instead of me inspiring my guests to come to a restaurant and scour the globe for all these exotic rare ingredients and spend all of this money, I can use the dining experience to educate and inspire my guest. And that was the epiphany. And at that point, I was still in Vegas, I still had a few more years left, and I started developing this business plan and thinking about what could this look like if I would go back home and actually start trying to produce all the food that would then be integrated on our menus. And that was in about, I think about 2005 at the time. So a little bit about the Western diet. We're all very, very familiar. Um, I study this so much, and I try to be as healthy as I possibly can be. I have my children that I'm trying to feed the best meal I possibly can, and I'm basically stuck. I mean, I go on the road, I stop at a gas station, I fill my car with gas, I go into the gas station, it's like there is nothing of nutritional value in that entire store. And what are we gonna do, you know? So even I struggle with this, and so I think as I kind of explain some of this, it's like, we have a long way to go in this country, in this world, to solve a lot of these problems. Current food system, extremely industrialized. Um, it's also very, very efficient. Most people don't realize this, but our, our food system is really, really efficient. Um, and there's some of the ways, you know, way commercial agriculture raises chickens, kind of the way that Joel Salton at Polyface Farms and a lot of other farmers are raising chickens. Pork production, same way. This is atrazine, this is a map of atrazine. I threw this in here because I wanted to kind of just show um, that the first one is 1997, and the red is 32 parts per million of atrazine, which is the number one chemical in uh, Roundup. And then now I found a newer one, which isn't super new, which is 2011. But if you look, the dark area is actually uh, 64 parts per million, so it's doubled 
Um, and it, we don't even know how much further uh, it might be affecting us. Food's not, def not just deficient in nutrients, but it's also becoming toxic because of the way that we're raising it. Um, these are things that affect us over the long term. Obesity, everyone knows how challenging it is to eat healthy food and stay in shape. And it, it, it's not uh, just an individual thing. It, it's really a big cultural system and food system thing. The standard American diet, which is now starting to be adopted all over the world. It's a very protein-heavy, rich diet, lots and lots of sugar. And then at the same time, as we're creating this food system and enjoying this product that doesn't have a lot of nutrients, we're also destroying our ecosystem. And so most people don't realize this, but every single desert in the world is man-made. And it's because of us as a species, we agriculture, through agriculture, we farm, we use up the organic matter, we use up the life in the soil, we degrade, and then we just move on. And that's a real, real problem. When I started Epiphany Farms and started looking into um, the, the CO2 emissions and everything that's going on with our environment, we were at 300 and I believe it was like 90 parts per million of CO2. And they were saying that in order for us to have a sustainable environment, we have to have 350 parts per million. Every single year, it's just ratcheting up two or three parts per million a year. And, and agriculture it contributes a lot to this. We have acidifying oceans. We're jeopardizing our soil health. So, you know, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to be able to fix this huge system? How are we going to... Um, be able to feed ourselves and our family cleaner food. I mean, this is, these are big, big, big issues that aren't going to just happen overnight. So the Sun and Moon site, Epiphany Farms, I was thinking to myself, it's like if I taught myself how to cook with no experience, and I go and I go to a great school, but I just learned under great professors, and I go and apply those things that I was learning into the kitchen and practice, then I could do that with farming. So what I did is I started researching who are like the godfathers of organic agriculture. What are the systems that I could look at and follow and practice? And so I started looking and learning about Masanobu Fukuoka, well, a book called One Straw Revolution. It's a really great read. It's like 100 pages. But his, he coined this thing called do-nothing farming in Japan. And he's basically extremely efficient, really, really you know, down to earth. Bill Molson is the creator of a thing called permaculture. In Australia, he was studying forest and natural forest evolution. And he's like, we can create agricultural systems that can just naturally evolve just like nature does. And it could be even more productive than what we currently have. And then Joel Salatin is the farmer from Polyface. So organic agriculture, um, obviously there's a lot of things now that are starting to come to the market that's organic. It's way more expensive usually. Um, it might not be as clean or as big, but it is decent. But regenerative agriculture, uh, is kind of like it's a subsector of organic. And what this means is that we're not just growing crops organically, but we're growing them in a way that is going to build and make the soil and the ecosystem better. It's regenerating. It's actually fixing the, the, the problem and fixing depleted and degraded soil. What do you do with regenerative agriculture? Well, we have a lot less tillage. We try not to till. Um, we have a lot more biodiversity. We use composting which you guys do a great job of here. We have mulching, crop rotation, cover crops, integrated livestock so they can bring the nutrient back to the, to the garden sites and the pastures, and decreased inputs. Now, biodiversity is different than organic agriculture. You can have organic conventional agriculture that mimics conventional agriculture, but you can also have an organic biodiverse system. And that's actually way, way better than just saying, well, the apple's organic. Because what's happened is the organic status is allowed for chemical inputs that then they regulate and say that are organic. But it's not necessarily sustainable or regenerative. And so that's what's really important about investing in local farmers and getting to know the actual farms that are producing your food. Composting, where it's like a closed waste stream to where all the food and the energy that we're wasting, we can actually capture that, bring it back to the farm compost it, and then feed our soil with natural organic matter and fertility. Mulching is huge. When we see tilled soil, it's almost like us peeling our skin off of our bodies, where, where everything is just basically um, volatizing, it's becoming oxidized, it's becoming dry and degraded. It's really, really important to keep the, the soil covered so that biology and microbes can keep living. Integrated livestock, bringing animals and chickens back to the garden sites, we, a lot of organic farmers in this area go 
two years where they farm vegetable crops, and then they go two years where they rotate and it's all pasture and they bring animals in, you know, whether it's cows or chickens or pigs, uh, and then, or hay, and then they, they kind of like regenerate the, the soil till. Permaculture, which was the, the Bill Molson, it's like one step even further than just being biodiverse, um, but it's actually looking at nature and mimicking your systems and your production systems to mimic the way that nature evolves. Um, and so it's a far more integrated system and you're really focusing on a lot of different design things to make sure that the site can continue to produce and, and become more regenerative and more biodiverse. So this is our, my eighth growing season. I had zero experience farming when I first started. And now these numbers are, I think, are a little out of date, but um, we raise all of the pork. We have about 250 hogs a year. We now have 1,000 laying hens. Um, last year we did 3,500 broiler chickens, but this year we're shooting for 4,500. We're just trying to get as many things going and integrated as possible. And we're doing about 500 or so different types of fruits and vegetables. Agritourism is a, is a big part of what we do. We do weekly tours to kind of showcase to our guests you know, what it is we're trying to accomplish. And we, with, since agriculture has gotten so large, all the equipment is also really, really big. And so it's hard to find the equipment that we need to keep things you know, at the right size. When we have our gardens are about 10 acres. And so we don't need a 120 horsepower tractor. We need something that's more, a little bit smaller. But this is an old 1952 Alice Chalmers cultivating tractor. It's called a G. Uh, and what that's for is for weeding. And so we plant everything in parallel rows, just like the big farmers. Uh, but then instead of using herbicides to keep weeds at bay, um, what we do is we have old tools, old toolbars and equipment, like shanks and disc and different things called finger weeders and stuff that we can actually weed in the row and, and, and keep things clean uh, of, of you know, weeds. There's a lot of weed pressure uh, in, the, in, a, in the organic system. These are some of our greenhouse and peppers. Right now all the peppers are coming in, so we have about 50 different varieties. This is our greenhouse um, back when we were trying to use this as a seating house and as a greenhouse, so we were kind of crammed in there. But now there's, I believe there's four total. A lot of microgreens, the basils and stuff that we grow are, uh, are really, really small because they're really, really packed with nutrients and dense with flavor. They're really quick too. This is one of the first things that I started growing. When I was working at Bradley Ogden's, the chefs were buying like $300 worth of microgreens a week. And so I was like, did some research, I was looking into this, and I had a bedroom at the time and roommates, and I got rid of my computer desk and I set up like six trays, got a bunch of seeds and started planting microgreens, and then within about a month I had a business and I was going to the restaurant and selling the chef the microgreens that I was producing in my home. And that was the first thing that started to get me to think about this like more integrated system and actually being able to provide the restaurant with the things that we produce. A lot of just pictures of the farm. We grow 50 different varieties of tomatoes. We have 5,000 tomato plants going this year. Biodiversity is key. That's really, really important. You know, each year you hear about farmers saying, oh, it was too wet or it was too dry or, you know, we had this one hailstorm. But it's like if you have a really, really, really biodiverse uh, ecosystem and a really biodiverse garden, then if one thing doesn't do well, then the other thing can do well and things can thrive. So you can keep on having a lot of um, great products throughout the entire season. This is our Moraine View property and Downs. Those are wild hops. And this is our kale plot this year. So we grow a ton of kale for, for different types of restaurants. So every about 10 or 15 beds, what we do is we actually set aside a bed just for pollinators, uh, beetle bunkers, and different types of beneficial insects so we can increase the, the population of them and, and keep the ecosystem like kind of uh, in balance. Wild berries, those are mulberries, white raspberries, black raspberries, blackberries, just a few months ago. We raise a lot of fungi at the restaurants. Fungi are extremely healthy for us, and we see an increase in the amount of mushrooms that we're utilizing at the restaurants. Um, so these are the cremini mushrooms. I actually took the cremini boxes that we got from the kitchen, I brought them to the farm, I stuffed them with sterilized boiled straw, and then I started to like, just propagate the, that mycelium. And then the next thing you know, I was, this was a test. The next year, I had cremini mushrooms growing in my greenhouse everywhere. I was like, it was really cool to see. So now we do creminis, uh, about seven different varieties of oysters, um, a lot of different fungi that are wild and cultivated. And that's another thing we're able to do in this area to be able to produce things year round um, and have, have crops coming 12 months out of the year. Four season farming is huge. When I first started farming, everyone was like, well, what are you gonna do in the winter? And it's like, 
well, I'm going to study guys that produce crops in the winter. So I started reading this, this book by Elliot Coleman. And Elliot Coleman was growing things through the winter in Maine, more, more north than we are here. And I was like, all right, cool, it is possible. So we started practicing. Uh, and things like arugula and clitonia or turnips, carrots, beets, spinach does awesome in the winter. Spinach is great. So we'll actually plant from the first week in February all the way to the first week in November. And it will take a little bit of a break uh, during January. But for the most part, there's things coming out of the garden and the greenhouses year-round. So this is called clitonia, or miner's lettuce. It's a weed in California. It's a delicacy here locally, which is really cool. We harvest a lot of the different things on property when it comes to like uh, maple syrup or black walnut syrup or sycamore syrup. We do this estate syrup where we harvest and tap the trees on our property, then bring them to the restaurant and boil it down to have our own uh, syrups. And then early, early in the season, you see how productive the, the n nature is and the timber sites are. So before we can even get into the gardens and till the soil, the forest is already producing tons and tons of biodiversity. Uh, so you have the mushrooms, you have ginseng. These are wild ramps, and wild ramps are in the onion family. They're a delicacy that's only available for about three weeks. So we go into the forest, we sustainably harvest them, then we pickle them, and then we can store those and feature those on our menus all year, which is really fun. We're now producing, we, we harvest about 1,000 pounds of ramps a year. And it's at a point now where we harvest the seeds and then we propagate them and plant them so we can have a, a sustainable uh, source of these through the future. Raise a lot of hogs. Um, they live outside year round. They don't receive vaccines. They don't, you know, we don't have a vet. I, I don't think that we've used a vet maybe once or twice in the last like eight years. Uh, but they're happy. They smile. They're in the environment where they're from. And you can't really necessarily, I mean, I don't know if you can taste it, but subconsciously, it's like you know that that product is so much better than the product of an animal that's raised in confinement. You know, it's, it's really, really great to know that they lived a really happy life and that I can treat it with respect at the farm and animal husbandry, but then I can bring it into the kitchen and I can then extend that to treating that product with respect. And that's super, super important a lot of times when we look at the things that we're cooking with and the things that we're handling, that we, we care for them. And that, that translates into our food. And that's that secret ingredient, right? That people say, a lot of people say, well, what's in this? What's secret? It's like, well, it's love. And what love is, is it's respect. It's respect for each other. It's respect for our product. And so it's really, really important. Um, and it's cool to be able to see that go from the farm all the way to, to the table. Those are our first batch of chickens that we had purchased. And we had our own dairy cow. She just passed away a little, uh, like, I think about a year ago, Pam. We raise a lot of bees. Each of the properties has bees. We can't raise nearly enough uh, honey. We, about five years ago, started going through all of our recipes and transferring everything from sugar, refined white sugar, to honey or more sustainable sweeteners. And in a lot of our recipes, we just started cutting the amount of sugar. Um, because at the end of the day, it's really, I think, sugar is ultimately the culprit of a lot of our, our diet issues. So trying to not have to use sugar in all of our recipes is really important. Every time now I go to the refined sugar bin, I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna use a little bit less. Raising chickens. These are called eggmobiles. Joel Salatin kind of made these things super famous. Um, they follow the, the, the cows and the herbivores that go around the property, and then they keep everything clean. The byproduct of them sanitizing the pasture and keeping it nice and clean and eating all the bugs are beautiful, delicious eggs. And every, you can tell when you have a really, really great egg because you crack it open, the shell is thick, the albumin is really, really stiff and high, and then that yolk is bright, bright orange from the carotene in the pasture that the bird is eating. When you see bright yellow yolks, they haven't received a lot of carotene in their diet, um, and so that, that's kind of like a, a symbol that it's not as nutritious. And one of the issues we have with the way that our food system is designed is that if we were to look up the nutritional analysis of an egg, we would see that it's all standardized. And they do that for a reason, so that they can standardize recipes and nutritional facts, but at the end of the day, an egg is not just an egg. An egg from Walmart that's been sitting on the shelf for weeks, that was raised in confinement, we crack it open, we taste it, we do a nutritional analysis, it's not gonna be the same as a freshly harvested, pasture-raised egg. But the industry doesn't recognize that. And that's a huge issue because they need everything to be standardized. But everything is not standard. Everything has got variants and variables. And so that's a big piece, I think, that we don't realize. We raise a lot of goats. A lot of the specialty product is, is raised and uh, sent to our restaurant for our chef's tasting. When we first started, we were at the farmer's market, and we 
Um, we're selling product, and we weren't making it, we weren't making a living. We were maybe making like $120 a week at the farmer's market. And I started to realize, like, we're going to go broke if we don't figure something else out here. And so guests would come up to the Bloomington farmer's market to buy our product, and I would basically convince them not to buy anything. I was like, don't buy anything. I was like, how about this? Instead, why don't we come into your home, and why don't we cook you an eight-course meal, and we'll give you, you know, the, one of the best meals of your life. Bring out your best china, supply some wine, we'll, we'll do the whole thing. And then we'll bring all the food from our farm and we'll, we'll cook for you. So we would arrive at their home, they would, we would purchase the product, um, we would go there, we would cook in their house, uh, then we would, they would sit down and we would go up to them at the beginning of the meal and I would tell them a little bit of our story and what we were trying to accomplish. Then, simultaneously, we would serve the first course. We had the entire meal choreographed to where the first course would come in. As the first course was being dropped, we'd be in the kitchen plating up the second course. Then we would you know, clear, do a full clear. Then the second course would come in, and we just kind of did this like, rhythm and like, this choreographed experience where really like, wowing the guests. and like, They didn't need to ask for anything. We were right there for them. We had their water glass full. Their next glass of wine was ready to go. The course was coming out in good timing. And then at the end of the meal, the guests would get up. They'd come back into their kitchen probably expecting that the kitchen would be destroyed because we just put out all of these amazing dishes, and, but we would be completely cleaned up. Everything would have been loaded up in like little like mice. We would just like sneak everything through the garage, back load up the truck, get everything looking really, really nice, and they would get up, they'd come into a kitchen. It was cleaner when they came in than it was when we arrived. And it was like, they, they loved it. And so these dinner parties, they, they became very, very popular. It got us on the front page of the Chicago Tribune, and next thing you know, we're doing like 115 of these things, like three a week. And people were actually just ordering the vegetables from us, and we would go to their home and prepare them for them, which was really cool. But that's what allowed us to start having an impact and also inspiring our guests to think differently about where they get their food from. So we were going to take out a loan to open up a restaurant. And then a struggling restaurateur had contacted us and said that we already have a restaurant. Um, I fear that if you open up a restaurant in downtown Bloomington, it's going to be the icing on the cake that puts us under. Like, what do you think about us coming in? So we went in for the weekend, um, and what we saw was a broken system, and we saw a broken culture. Everyone was about, like, me, 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 mine, mine, mine. They were in and out, kind of lazy. They didn't acknowledge people. They just acted pissed off all the time. They were drinking alcohol on the job. Uh, they weren't following good food sanitation uh, techniques. It was like, we saw this and we're like, why would we go in debt trying to build a restaurant as opposed to just walking into a restaurant and then revitalizing it? That's way more sustainable to me than to build a fresh restaurant from scratch. So we ended up just showing up at the restaurant. We went into the back door. We went into the kitchen and we started cooking with the team. We started teaching them. We started showing them how, you know, here's how to keep your knife sharp. Here's how to keep your station clean. You know, here, here's how to call corner or behind. You know, here's how not to slam the oven door, not to drop the ice, ice machine bin. It's like we're going to respect our product, we're going to respect our environment, respect each other. Let's give each other high fives, let's smile. Not everyone's going to feel great every day, but if they walk into an environment that's like radiant and positive and upbeat, it's going to be a lot easier to get through your day. And then when, you know, if you supply that energy and that love to your teammates, and then the next day they don't feel well, when they walk into that, it's like you're gonna, we're going to cover for each other. We're going to support each other. And the day goes by so fast. And so we just started doing these things. We peer police each other. And someone walks in with a big gulp or, you know, they're on their third giant Red Bull of the day. It's like, hey, you know, here's, here's some uh, water with a splash of raw apple cider vinegar. You know, it's, it, it's an, it lifts you up, but it also cleanses your body and it's, it's better for you. Less sugar. So we, we almost like, we encourage and help each other out because it's so challenging in this environment to live healthy. We make a, a point every single day to, to sit down for a half an hour and eat with each other. So a different cook prepares the meal uh, each day. We all break out. We go into the private dining room. We sit down and we eat and we enjoy. And I know that at least every day we can have at least one good, healthy, made from scratch meal. And that, that's really, really important. Then we get to meet each other and like, we actually adopt each other. I mean, when you work in a kitchen or in a, in a, in a restaurant, it's like everyone kind of becomes family. You start to care for each other and look out for each other. So this was basically the, the things that we started to do. And then a byproduct of that was that things started to improve. Guests started to love the food. We started getting rid of all the corn syrup and the refined sugar and the artificial flavorings. And we stopped buying Caesar dressing. We started making it. We stopped buying pre-bagged lettuce. And we started you know, selecting it and cutting it ourselves and washing it ourselves. And it's like 
guests can taste that. They can taste love. And even though you can't quantify it sometimes, when you put the little extra effort into it, it really will pay off in the long run. So now the restaurants, they're pretty, pretty busy. We have Epiphany Farms restaurant, which is the old Central Station. Um, we, I feel like we've remodeled this place two or three times already. But there's 160 seats. It's a little bit more refined. It's definitely the best dining experience in Central Illinois. Um, we have an extensive wine and liquor program. The restaurant, I love it. Um, our kitchen's really outdated. We're hoping to remodel our kitchen soon. I hear that you guys are getting a new kitchen, so I'm kind of jealous. The food is, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, you're going to eat some greens when you come there. You're going to eat, you know, raw food, you're gonna eat raw vegetables, um, radishes, things that you don't usually get to order or eat. I always tell our guests, trade choice for trust. Uh, heirloom tomato salad, it's, we grow 50 varieties, but the idea is that it, it displays an array, a biodiversity, like what we want our landscape to look like is what we can create our plates to look like. They can be a harmonious dish, they can have texture, beautiful colors, um, that's really, really important. So when I go and I'm looking at tomatoes and I have five different varieties of tomatoes, what I'll do is I'll do five different knife cuts. So in this way, when they see it visually, subconsciously, they're seeing that there's a lot of biodiversity, not only in the food, but also in the way that I prepared the product, the way that I cut it, the way that I sliced it. This is Anju above, I think in the description, uh, in the introduction we talked about how this is sushi versus pizza. It's, it used to be called bogeys of the loft. Um, but this is exactly the opposite of Epiphany Farms. It's, it's fast, it's casual. You order things, it just comes flying to the table. It's meant to just be shared. It's almost like a tapas restaurant. Um, but there's 95 seats. It's open seven days a week, lunch and dinner. It's extremely affordable for what, what you get. Um, and anju is a word in Korea that means food that pairs well with alcohol. And so if you say anju chuseal, it means uh, can I have some, some bar snacks, basically. And so that's what the menu at, at anju is. Um, but everyone would say, like, you're crazy. Sushi and pizza? And I'm like, I think it's going to work. Like, the first time that I ever had sushi, I, I hated the texture of the nori, the seaweed that would get stuck in my mouth. Uh, the first time I had raw fish, I think I was 19 when I went to the school in New York. Um, and I was like, I want to create an environment where you don't have to feel uncomfortable to try something for the first time. And then the guests that can come with you, if they don't want to eat raw food or raw fish, then they can have a pizza, they can have something else, you know, wings or dumplings or something like that. And then we specifically use a different type of, of nori. Uh, it's Korean, it's called gim. But the way that they make it, they don't press it, and they also toast it and season it. And so it falls apart in your palate and falls apart in your mouth. It's a lot more expensive, but it's way, way better when it comes to the texture of the roll in your mouth. And it's something I feel that you know, people in this area think it's a little bit more pleasant. But it's funny, because I read the Yelp reviews, and I read the TripAdvisor, and it's like, oh, I don't know how to make sushi. The roll is falling <laughs> apart. And it's like, well, it's a lot harder to make sushi with this stuff, because it's, it's really thin and tender. With all of our restaurants, you'll see the chefs come out of the kitchen. And you know, when, I, when I dress for, to be at the restaurant as a cook, I'm dressing for success. You know, a lot of people in the back, I'll say, well, someday I want to get tipped, you know, as, as a server. And it's like, well, the, the key difference between a cook and, and someone that's able to get tipped from the guest is that you actually have guest interaction and guest contact. And so I think it's really cool for, for chefs to be able to come in, you know, treat their uniform with respect, and then be able to even bring their food to the guests and describe what it was that they cooked for them. And I, I think that's really, really powerful. So we encourage that with all of our cooks to, but they have to look good and they have to, you know, they have a clean uniform, which is key. A year ago, actually, this week, uh, we opened up a restaurant that I grew up going to. It's called the Old Bank Restaurant in Leroy. The idea with this was that Leroy was a very, very like, hard-nosed agricultural community. They used to have great restaurants. The menu of this restaurant uh, 30 years ago we had like langoustines and lobster and like, all these amazing things that we would eat in these small rural communities. They had oysters on the menu, Oyster Rockefeller, and now it's like no one has that. And so I, I kind of wanted to create a menu that would be able to compete with McDonald's or Arby's um, or any of these fast, casual, fast food restaurants, but be completely made from scratch and also be supplied by our farm. And it's been open a year. Uh, the community's embraced it. We're about to add a six-day. We're going to be opening up on Tuesdays. And um, it's like Americana. It's burgers and ribs and smoked chicken. It's, it's really fun to be able to produce this um, for, for the people that I grew up with, which is nice. So the old bank. We also do a lot of events. There's eight event locations. We do catering, off-sites, dinner parties still, but then we also have all the different restaurants and things like that. 
lot of agro-tourism. We've been featured. We've, we're very, very honored to be, uh, to be here in, in central Illinois, but also for people to be paying attention to us. And in the beginning, I was always discouraged that I was in this area and there wasn't a lot of press and there wasn't any like reviews or food critics. Or, and I, but I think it's, it's, it's also cool to be at home and be in this space and actually to start in an area where we can actually have some serious improvement. Um, and now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm watching and a lot of people around the world are paying attention to what we're doing here and they're implementing these systems. So it's really, really cool and encouraging to me to see that we can have an impact, uh, not only locally, but also globally. We've been recognized. So Dan Barber has a, a restaurant called Blue Hill in New York. He is a phenomenal chef. I, if I wanted to start Epiphany Farms, I'd probably be working for Dan Barber. Uh, he has a, a gr two great TED Talks. One is the foie gras paradigm, and the other one is how I fell in love with the fish. And it's, it's an 18 minute long talk. It's very, very inspiring. But in that talk, he ends with this quote. And I think that this quote, it really symbolizes like what, what it is um, about our concept and about our, our, our diet and everything that we need to change. But um, I'll end with this. Our, our bread basket is threatened today, not because of diminishing supplies, but because of diminishing resources. Not by the latest combines or tractor invention, but by fertile land. Not by pumps, but by fresh water. Not by chainsaws, but by forests. Not by fishing boats and nets, but by the fish in the sea. If we want to feed the world, let's start asking how are we going to feed ourselves, or better, how can we create a condition that every community can feed itself? And I think that that's, you know, that's really, really cool. Um, and I think that's what we should be focusing on, is feeding our community, feeding our family, um, and then also feeding our local businesses. Well, thanks a lot for your time. I'm nervous because we're cooking the food and I'm here talking to you guys. <laughs> I think we're going to do um, a, li a little Q&A as, as the, the service team is, is providing our meal and serving us. Yeah. How do you recruit and retain talented and passionate professionals? All right, so the question is, how do you uh, recruit and retain talented uh, professional individuals? Um, I would say it's been six years now since we took over Central Station. For the, vast, the, last, for the first five years, it was really about us just taking um, hungry individuals and training them. We a lot of homegrown talent, a lot of just working with the team and teaching them the techniques. Um, we didn't really have a lot of national publicity, so we haven't been able to drive cooks and, and hospitalitarians to, to this region. But when I was working at like Thomas Keller at Guy Savoie, and, and Bradley Ogden's, I, what I was seeing was once they got national fame, all of a sudden people were moving to the area to work there specifically. And just recently, like the last year, we've had a huge influx in um, individuals actually moving to this area to come work for us. And so it's starting to be a little bit easier for us to staff our restaurants. And I could see this like tipping point that we're about to hit, um, which, which is really fun for us to see. But, a lot of it is, you know, people come with, with, without a culinary degree. They might not even have experience in the kitchen. Um, but it's like if they have good energy, if they're positive, if they pay attention to the way that they move, if they're quick, if they're efficient, um, if they're eager, it's like we, can, we work with them and we teach them. And you give them good hands-on demos and we hold each other accountable. And, you know, the team just kind of, it, it occurs. It keeps getting better and better. Yeah? That is a great question. Uh, what is your favorite way to slice a ugly, gnarly heirloom tomato? All right, so that was the thing I was talking about with all these variances and variables. In the kitchen, we get these beautiful slicer tomatoes that are designed to be sliced. Um, I think we even, the industry probably even likes them to be a little bit um, unripe because then they can cut easier. The best way that I like to go about it is the scarring on the, the backside, which is a, I think it's called like a cat, cat print or something but I'll, I'll lightly cut, cut off any scarring on the bottom. Then I'll split the tomato in half, cut out and get rid of the, all the excess, and then I, I just slice it with a sharp knife. And I try not to, if I have a sharp knife, what I'll see is that I won't have a lot of uh, pooling. So the sharper your knife, the less cell wall damage that you're gonna have. And so I won't get a lot of pooling on the cutting board. I can keep that, um, that juice and that flavor intact. The other thing though I do is like if I was cutting off the top of the tomato, I might cut it a little deeper, but then I would put all the tops to the side, 
cut the entire, all the tomatoes. Then I would go back to the tops, lay them on my cutting board, line them up nice, and then I would cut the tops to give myself a dice, but I would only lose just the core. And so my goal is to have like the best possible yield um, that I can have. And so that's another cool thing about composting is that you actually can see the amount of waste that you have and what you're throwing away. And in the beginning years, I would pick up the compost from the restaurant and bring it back to my home and compost it. So if I was dumping out the compost and I saw like a, a, half, a, a half a head of lettuce or a giant beet or like very poor yield on tomatoes, like I would see it. But nowadays, we, we focus on yields with our cooks. And, um, you know, food cost is super important. If we want to be able to pay ourselves more and have more for our staff and our talent, then we need to be more efficient cooks. And we need to have less breakage and less waste and all that good stuff. So um, that's, that's important. Any other questions? Yeah. So is there something you haven't done yet that you're looking forward to maybe it, accomplishing? The question is, uh, is there something that we haven't done yet that we're looking forward to accomplishing? Um, yes, there's a lot. Everyone asks us, like, did you ever think that this was going to happen? Like, did, you know, three restaurants. And it's like, yeah, I, I definitely... I think we had a three-year, a five-year, and a 10-year goal. The three-year goal for us having our first restaurant happened like to the month. It was three years after I moved here. The five-year goal was to have a second restaurant. And I feel like we, treat, we cheated a little bit because our second restaurant was in the same building. But that's important because we kind of like leveraged our risk as entrepreneurs and we had less risk because we opened up our second concept in the same building. Um, the 10-year goal was to have multiple restaurants a, a, a wholesale bakery and food commissary kitchen, and then also to be able to operate and farm 100 acres. And all that happened last year at year seven. And I think the reason why we're starting to kind of speed up a lot more than I had ever visioned was that I never knew how much we would be able to get done by having 200 talented, high-performing team members all working towards a common goal. And now that that's happening, things are really, really starting to amp up and pick up. So. Um, we would really like to have an operator hotel someday. Um, we're turning our 70-acre farm in Downs into a um, holistic hospitality school where you can get a certificate and actually learn about um, farming and distribution and packing and then utilizing in the kitchen. There's, there's a lot of opportunities. I think it's tough because when I first came up with this concept, I was at home just dreaming it up and throwing it on, uh, on the computer. And now I'm like, I have to kind of care about 200 family members, like 200 employees. It's like if I make the wrong decision, if I overextend the company, or if we take on more than we can handle, like I fear that I won't be able to supply and support my team, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of where we're at now. I'm trying to gently continue to push and move the company forward. Cool. Yeah? Oh, cool. All right, so the question is, are there, any, um, are there any current culinary trends that we're starting to see and then also apply to our menus, I believe is the question? Oh, to, to get rid of? Oh, man. Um, what are some things that I'm excited to get rid of? Okay, unedible garnishes. It's like, if you can't eat it, why is it on the plate? Uh, plating the rim of a plate. When we look at a plate, um, the rim is the, is the frame, and the canvas is the center of the plate. And so looking at that center of the plate and focusing on plating it and, and painting your picture on the canvas is really, really important, not outside of that. Um, I have a thing called the spoon rule with soups. So if it can't fit on a teaspoon, it shouldn't be in your soup. I mean, we're not serving knives with our soups, uh, so it's kind of challenging. And then also the fork rule, it's like, if it's a vegetable, it should be sliced properly or the right size or lettuce, things like that. Um, I don't know, the, the newest kitchen that I'm in now working, it's like the pre-made, they're, they're buying dressings, they're buying coleslaw, there's like pre-shredded uh, cabbage for, for coleslaw. It's like, like making things from scratch and caring about your knives and producing things, that's really, really important. I, I think that we're trying to get into the fast casual sector a little bit more. We know that fine dining is really, really hard uh, for everyone to access on a weekly basis or, or all the time. And so I think with uh, the growth of Epiphany Farms now is how can we have fast casual concepts 
and serve really, really, really affordable, made from scratch food, but then also supply the product for it. Um, but the, yeah, there's, there's a lot of food trends out there and it, it all depends on like which restaurant. The, the fun thing is like, because the farm is so diverse, we have Asian vegetables, we have American type of products, we have all these different things, but by having all the different types of restaurants, then we can ha kind of play into that biodiversity. And so that's huge by having the different um, restaurants and the different themes. It, it's also cool because you can express yourself. Like, I might want to do a more Asian-inspired dish, but maybe it's not the right place for Leroy at the old bank. But since we have an Asian-influenced restaurant, then that's the place where we can have that creative output and that flow. And so I think having multiple dining areas and multiple menus really caters to not only our team spotlight, but then also all the things that we're producing from the farm. Cool, yeah? My favorite seasoning, salt, all right? And it's not pepper. I cannot stand when we mix salt and pepper. Um, so salt, salt changes food on a molecular level. Pepper is a spice. S salt will actually change the polarity of the molecules on your food so that when it hits your tongue, you can um, break down those flavors. And so salt is really, really important. And salt is also a, an essential mineral to us in our existence. So really high quality sea salt could have up to like 50, 60 micronutrients and, and um, different um, nutrients on the periodic table that we have to have, minerals and things like that. So salt is a, is a huge thing. And you don't wanna have too much salt and you wanna always add salt in layers. And so if something goes in the pan, a little bit of salt. Next layer, a little bit of salt. And at the end, it should just need a touch. Uh, it should have already been seasoned in layers. But that, that's really, really important. Most of the time, what we're missing is just salt added in layers earlier on in the cooking process than at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to need to take some of this bread home. It's delicious. <laughs> um, tell us what we're eating here. Tell us about what we've got. The, so there's two types of bread. It's the cranberry walnut and then the cracked wheat. The cracked wheat has the three ingredients, flour, salt, and water. Um, there's a natural yeast that we, we harvest from the bakery, and then it's pretty, pretty basic stuff. Um, we have a flour mill at our bakery, so a lot of our breads have uh, locally produced wheat that we crack and then apply uh, and add to the doughs. So the cracked wheat is really, really clean, simple, local wheat, uh, and then the cranberry walnuts just got the cranberries, a little kick of, uh, of sugar. And then a really basic uh, mixed lettuce uh, field green salad. Yep, thank you. Yeah. How often do you do the tours that you refer to as how do you plan out for one of those? Um, the, the tours we do pretty often, uh, almost like once, once a week, every Saturday, there's a farm tour at the farm in Bloomington. Uh, you can sign up by calling up the restaurants or you can just show up. Uh, and that happens, I believe, nowadays they're happening at like 4.30 in the afternoon on Saturdays. And our, our website has all that information. Do we do wine? Do we do, we do wine? wine? Wine. Do we grow it? Or make it? Uh, so uh, three years ago, I planted uh, two acres of Corot Noir and Norton. There was one slide that had a hill, and like that was actually our vineyard that we planted. Uh, and our goal is to be able to produce our wine. But I don't kind of like honey. I don't think we'll ever be able to produce enough to what we need. But the idea of actually producing it and having some. So we'd like to, in the future, be able to make our own uh, vermouth. Uh, which is a distillation of uh, grapes and medicinal herbs. And so that's kind of our, uh, our future, but it's tough to, to make that work. The, the question is, do we sell our, our produce to the public? And at this point, there's a marketplace at Epiphany Farms where the public can buy product. But we supply all the three restaurants, main restaurants that we have, the new restaurant Springfield, and then we supply um, Italy in Chicago, we go up to Chicago twice a week and we, everything that we basically produce on surplus goes there and now just this year we added the Waldorf Astoria. So all of our product that we're producing is specifically going to chefs. So I would say about 99% of our food goes to chefs as opposed to the general public. When, it, when I was selling at the farmer's market, I was also realizing that I was competing against other local farmers and we have the ability to sell to a market that's that's in Chicago and the chefs that are looking for our product. And so I'd much rather supply them and allow the local farmers to be able to supply the public at this point. 
I think that the, the farmer's market needs some help when it comes to people going there and, and, and doing their grocery shopping. And it's also very, very competitive now because there's a lot of people that are getting into farming. And so I'd prefer to like not try to compete too much. Cool. Any other questions? Salad's good? Thanks a lot. I really, really appreciate your time. Enjoy your lunch. Cool. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Oh, cool. Got some gifts for you here, too. Thank you. Did you, did you want to um, go over the menu for the rest of lunch with everybody? Yeah, I'm not super familiar on the menu. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't put you on the spot there, so. No, no worries. Uh, I think our best bet was Craig, who leads the, the event. Or actually, I can just look at the menu. So I've been, I cooked at, uh, I was at the restaurant in Springfield yesterday, and I'm going there right after this, too. <laughs> Um, a housemade salad. The vinaigrette is a it, it's a, it's a rice wine vinaigrette, and the way it starts is you use an egg yolk. Um, you put all of your part of the particulate in the blender, so you have egg yolk. Um, a, the ratio for a vinaigrette is one part vinegar, three parts oil. But I always add 0.5 parts water. So in the blender, it goes egg yolk, 0.5 part water, one part vinegar, a dash of um, hot sauce, a spoon of mustard twice the amount of honey, salt, pepper, and then you turn that on high and emulsify in uh, salad oil or a clear oil. Uh, and then that, we usually use uh, grapeseed oil. And then that makes a beautiful white emulsion, and that's an emulsified vinaigrette, which is uh, like our base salad. And that's using rice wine vinegar. So that's what the salad's seasoned with. Uh, pasta primavera, Epiphany Farms roasted chicken. So the chicken we raise on pasture, I explained that process. But then what we do is we do a lemon, honey, garlic, uh, brine. It brines for 12 hours. After it brines whole, we then break it down. We separate the dark meat and the white meat because they have two different cooking temps. Uh, white meat, you're gonna only wanna get to about 155. Dark meat, you want it to go a little bit further. So if we cook those on the same pan, the white meat would be overcooked before the dark meat. And so we separate those and cook them separately. Um, and then uh, Pivoty Farms, like just a mix of uh, the farm fresh vegetables and then our roasted garlic mashed potatoes. So again, please join me. Thank uh, Chef Ken for his time and uh, Pivoty Farms for lunch today. Thank you. So, really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you.